Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. My name is Barry Trackenberg. I'm the Interim Director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Albany. And today uh, I have the great honor of introducing our two wonderful speakers uh, for their discussion on Philip Roth. As most of you are aware, since uh, you're familiar faces and you've come to our events in the past, this event this afternoon is part of a larger series that the Center for Jewish Studies is putting on that is hosted by the Association for Jewish Studies as part of a grant given to them by a group called the Legacy Heritage Project. Now I'll just take a minute to introduce our speakers. To my immediate left is Elisa Albert, who is, let me see if I get this correct, the author of three works, right? The, the first being How This Night is Different, a book of short stories that I've taught several times to my students, and it's been a wonderful. And then more recently, the book of Dahlia, and then very recently, an edited volume called Freud's Blind Spot, which is a study of sibling relationships, and anyone who has siblings, like myself, will find it a very, very compelling, disturbing read at times. <laughs> Uh, Elisa received her bachelor's from Brandeis University and uh, an MFA from Columbia University. Right? And then to her left is Ed Schwarzweil, who's also a professor of English at U Albany. He received his BA, now I'm going back here to old conversation from Cornell University, yes. correct? And PhD from University of Washington, St. Louis, right. is that correct? Okay. He's also the author of two works. The, the first is a novel, Responsible Men, which I have also happily taught to my students at the university. And uh, both of them have actually come in and spoken to the students, so I know they're terrific speakers. And more recently, The Family Diamond, uh, a collection of short stories. And they are here today to talk about Philip Roth and his influence in American fiction on themselves as writers. And I believe they'll each talk for a little bit of time and then open up to a conversation. So with that, I'd like to please welcome our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out too. On a, on a, I can't believe it's a snowy day again. I mean, how, how did that, how did that happen? Uh, it's not <laughs> for the price of one. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, Philip Roth. But I mean, I, I think I, I can, I can preface all this by saying that we really hope this is a conversation. We're not here to lecture. Uh, we're here to just talk about Philip Roth and our experience reading him and, and hopefully draw upon your experience of reading him. There, there are a ton of books back there. We've read some of them. You've read some of them. Maybe uh, all of us together have managed to read all of the books. Uh, I don't know. There, there could be another one coming out tomorrow, so we'll have to, we'll have to catch up really soon. But I thought we were, go we're going to start by just talking about what it was like to read him at, at first for us and then what, it was, what it's like to read him now. I think, uh, and then we'll we'll sort of go off from there. We have some uh, quotes that we might refer to later on, and and then we'll see how it goes. But uh, I thought maybe Elisa would start. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I'll start. Hi, I'm Elisa. Um, thank you, Barry, for having us yeah. today. Yes, it's lovely to be here with you all, talking about um, one of my favorite authors, my favorite living author, certainly. Um, Present well, company. Present company excluded. <laughs> um, I, I didn't read Roth, though, uh, until relatively late. Um, late, I mean, late in my, relatively speaking. Um, I, I started to read Roth a little bit in high school when I was, you know, voraciously consuming every book I could get my hands on. And I found him to be unbearable. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I felt like he was misogynistic. I felt like he was, uh, you know, tangled up in, in, in such complicated relationship with his Jewish identity, and I myself hadn't even begun to grapple. So it just seemed needless and overwrought and, you know, kind of, uh, kind of ridiculous. So I, I put him aside, and I, I would sort of scoff whenever he came up and say, ah, oh, that guy totally irrelevant to me. Um, but then something happened. Um, and in my, in my mid to late 20s, I, I, I just 
Philip Roth's oeuvre just opened up to me, and I and I felt like I had found the kindred spirit, um, a writer who was so essential and and vital and important um, and absolutely relevant to me um, as a Jew, as a writer, as a woman, as a human being. Um, and uh, I think I think that's a, that's an interesting thing. I'd love to I'd love to hear from from some of you uh, about about your history with Roth. A lot of you have probably been reading Roth for a lot longer than I've been alive, and um, that perspective is is of great interest to me. Um, so what what ended up happening with me is that I I, uh, I was inspired by Roth um, and by his use of the alter ego in particular. Um, Nathan Zuckerman, most importantly, but you know, many others throughout the other books, um, to sort of uh, engage with my readers in in a way um, that that seemed to be kind of echoing Roth's use of the alter ego, um, to sort of tease and invite and reject and um, you know mess with. The reader um, sort of hears something really personal and intimate. No, actually, it's not at all. But maybe it is. But maybe it's not. And what do you want from me? And what do you think you know about me from reading this? And why do you think you know that? And do you think you own me? Do you think you know me? Um, all those, all those dynamics played into the way that I came to to express myself in fiction. Um, so. That's, I think that's a good a good place to, to start. I mean, can you you have you, I, people who haven't read your book don't know about the the way the that story collection ends. Right. And the very last story is a is an open letter. I mean, maybe and that that gives a concrete example of how you were addressing his, his right. work. Right. So the the final story in my in my short story collection is uh, is in the form of a letter to Philip Roth from a writer named Elisa Albert. Um, who is somewhat like me, but who is not me. Um, um, and in this letter, the writer, um, Elisa, is, uh, is bemoaning sort of the state of her life and her ambition and her failed relationships and all of her sorrows and, um, and coming to a uh, you know, culminating point of uh, asking Roth if she can bear him a child, um, because Roth is famously, um, you know, uh, childless, uh, kind of a loner, lives in a pretty isolated, um, circumscribed way, um, and so, and so this this seemed to be a solution um, to uh, to to Elisa Albert and and to a projection of Philip Roth, based of course on his books, which. Is not an appropriate way to uh, assume you know of somebody. <laughs> um, so, I'll, yeah. what changed for you? You said in the beginning you found you a misogynist, you found mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. And when you were in your mid twenties, you caught on. Can you explain that a little bit? Did you answer that question? Mm -hmm. um, it, that's a great question. I think what changed for me is that I got to the other side of my own very insular and infuriating Jewish upbringing. Um, and I, I escaped um, in, into my own adulthood where I could suddenly start to look at where I had come from, and he was a great help in that. Um, when I was in it, when I was you know, 17 years old and, and stuck at Jewish sleepaway camp and had no tools to articulate what was wrong with that community for me and why that felt unfulfilling and why I felt so uh, you know, just outside of it all and wrong, um, he, he felt very claustrophobic and upsetting. Um, but once I had gotten a tiny bit of perspective, he he seemed like uh, kind of a, a a strong hand from above I could I could hold on to to pull me even farther into an adulthood away from away from that insular upbringing. I was going to ask a similar question. I would have thought it was a new, it was a book that came out that you started to read by Roth, and then you reconsidered it. You changed. Uh, 
So you like even the early ones? Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely it was me who changed. Um, and that, and I, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of of picking up a book that you read ten years ago, twenty years ago, beyond, uh, and finding that it's a very different book. Um, because because as as is it is it uh, Whitman? The, the it's not so much the oh right right the, the book the book itself is not the complete thing but the the, the reader of the book is the complete thing and the reader of the book completes the book and, and mm -hmm. makes the book meaningful uh, but it was still misogynistic wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> well I I think I, I I came to see it as more of a comment on misogyny than than than, uh, than an act of misogyny. I came to see it as, as more of a, of a, of a, of an exploration. Um, and, and I think that also had to do with coming to understand that the conflation of writer and narrator is one that is completely fraught and, and when you mess it up, you don't read a book right. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you remember which book it was? Did, uh... At first I think it was, uh, I was, I was assigned Counter Life and I just, I was, I had to admit that no matter what else I felt, it was a dazzling, dazzlingly constructed book. Mm -hmm. And that the, the, the work itself was just, you know, inarguably wonderful. Uh, and then I was sort of open and I, I it's sad to see her that, uh, that just knocked me conscious. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, it, each, each, and then you know the wonderful thing about discovering that you love a writer like Rob is that then you have this enormous body of work that you can delve into, and you just feel like great, like I, there's more awaiting me. Um, I still haven't read them all. I still haven't read When She Was Good or Let It Go. Um, so it's nice to know that they're out there. I was going to say, once you get over the misogyny and your feminist mishigas, and that's what it is, you realize he really doesn't like people. <laughs> right. He does the same with men. Uh, He's really a misogynist. Well, we'll talk about mishigas in another talk, perhaps. But, um, but it's true. He's not, you know, he's, he's, been, he's been called a self hating Jew for as long as he's been writing, but he's just a misanthrope. He's, he, he doesn't hate Jews, he just has issues with everybody. As, as should we all, if we're open-eyed and honest. Yeah, of course. You know, I've read this stuff for quite a while, and the first one I ever read was one I had to hide from my parents, and you don't have to say what they're wrong with um, And I've never been able to get through the, the Sabbath theater, I've tried many times. Um, and. Um, the first minute I lay eyes in his books, and I love some of them a lot, I thought that he was totally misogynist. Every other book I've read of his, I felt he's totally misogynist. I feel no reason to get over that. <laughs> and read it despite the fact that I think that he's totally misogynist. So I'm not sure exactly what, so what, you know, what does it mean to get over it? Well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I think once you separate out the fact that Roth himself is not speaking in these novels. They are characters speaking. Um, they're, they're, it's a narrative voice. You're, uh, well, but we, can't, we can't assume we know anything about Roth himself. He's exploring a dynamic that might not be palatable, pleasant, ideal, but who among us is any of those things all the time? Um, right, I mean, I think it's fair to, I mean, it's a good question, Bob, and I, I, think, I think it's fair to grant a writer their obsessions or their themes or, or, or the world that they are going to refer to. It's like, I'm, I'm from Philly, so I have a, a slight animus against New Jersey, uh, and, and, and all these books are in Newark, 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 and, uh, and that's okay, you know, I mean, I, I, I could just not read them because they're not about Philly, they're about New Jersey, but... I read them because each each book is incredible, and he, he, the sentences are beautiful, and the, his his insight into human consciousness is is just is is just always sharp. Uh, but he is always going to return to this issue of 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 the relationships between men and women, and and the women in the books don't get to shine, uh, to put it 
too mildly uh, the way that the men do. But it's, it's just part of, it's, it's, it's the same as Newark in a way. It's just part of the world he's going to describe. And I, I think you're right. You either can just say, well, I'm going to stop reading him, or, or you read him understanding that that's just going to be there every time. And I think to add to that, yeah. it, it's never the writer's responsibility. A, a novelist is not responsible to present happy realities about human nature. So, I mean, if we agree that a lot of men of Ross generation have some misogynistic tendencies, um, then we can look at Roth as a gold mine of insight into these people. Um, it's not Roth. We're not. We we can't call Roth a misogynist because Roth doesn't write nonfiction. Um, Roth is not writing about himself. No matter how close he may get, or how much he may tease us, or how much he may flirt with sort of like, this is me. Um, it's not. No, Claire Bloom. Uh, Claire Bloom might call him. I don't know. <laughs> but there, there, was there a question back here? Yeah. I just finished reading his latest book, and um, I think it gives you a really interesting picture of him. I, I, I see him. That's him. He, and at the beginning of it is, is fascinating. And then you fall into the whole... No, the... Yeah. Nemesis? Or, no, no. It was the, um, the humbling. Yeah, okay. And... Um, and, and I felt sorry for him. I felt sad for him because I, I see it as him. And I think that, you know, I have to forget all the original feelings I had about the same feelings about him. I, I haven't, I read him, I read Goodbye Columbus and that's it. And then I got to this one. Wow. And, and it's a real jump. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely refuse to read him. That's interesting. Do you have any desire to go back now? Now that you have some. With his, his sense of identity, that's very hard because I'm so steeped in being what I am. But uh, it's it's pain. Well, he he gives us this amazing this amazing body of work where we can go from Goodbye Columbus to the humbling, and we can go from this 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 you know virility and and masculine coming of age um, and and hubris to to I mean called the humbling. It's a it's a it's an impotent old man who is facing down mortality. Um, there aren't many writers who have given us this kind of body of work where we can we can really follow them um, from beginning to end. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I I um, I think I'm aware of uh, from from what you're saying what others have said that. Uh, there's a difference between admiring and liking the author and relating to the body of work the author produces. And I, I also sense that there are, there are three different things that, that, uh, that you've been saying about the, these works. First of all, they're virtuoso performances. I mean, he is just remarkable as a craftsman. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the stories are particularly gripping. But I think what, what you're most importantly uh, pointing out is the degree to which we resonate with the issues, with the uh, with the anxieties, with the with the um, with, with the uh, outrage about the reality of people and people's behaviors, etc. And that seems to be, at least for me, mm -hmm. that's the most engaging kind of thing. While on the one hand, there's a kind of a fantasy and this displacement onto these characters, and yet, if I if I can make bold and use the word truth. He is so constantly revealing and bearing the the the, the, uh, the nature of people and the, the nature of relationships that we think are are true, and is getting something that we feel good about seeing ourselves. As long as we feel validated in seeing that, even in an, as idiosyncratic a character as he. Yes. Yeah, is, is there is there a book in particular that resonates with you, or are there which ones would you? This is one, the ones. The one, I, I had a, a, a personal anecdote which makes one stick out. I, I had a, a, a person I was um, friendly with, a kind of idiosyncratic writer, something named Jersey Kozinski. Mm -hmm. Remember, very, very mm -hmm. kind of person. Yes. And I had the opportunity to, to <clears throat> arrange and bring Jersey to Israel for his first and I think only trip ever to Israel. And on one day we were sitting at the King David Hotel and I was kind of the the, uh, the fourth wheel. But sitting around the table were Jersey Kozinski, 
Philip Roth and Iron Applefeld. Oh. And, the reason, and the, reason that's, the reason that's relevant to this discussion is that uh, Roth was there to um, uh, announce or to plan for the publication of the Hebrew translation of Counterlife. And we had this long discussion of what would be an appropriate Hebrew translation of the term Counterlife, which is really untranslatable. You know, Chaim Shekenegat or something like that, but I think they just called it counter life in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also agree with you when, when you were saying that that's, that's um, strikingly not only virtuoso, but, but so it so opens up so much of reality, different aspects of ourselves, you know, and the, the complexity of it. So I think that that was the one that, uh, man, of course, Portnoy's complaint was one of the, the, the originating ones that I think is exactly <laughs> take. But, but I think Counter Life is the one that, of the ones that I've read, I've read uh, several of them are the ones that are <coughs> most, most uh, engaging and moving and transforming. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think of him as a kind of transgressive writer. That the one, like, one word. Very, very young, maybe in high school, reading Portnoy, mm -hmm. he was describing his uh, masturbatory fantasies with a psychiatrist. I mean, Can you write about things like that? <laughs> and then there was uh, the Anne, somebody who may or may not be Anne Frank in The Ghost Rider, with almost something like the word is blasphemous, sacrilegious, or something like that. You can't talk about Anne Frank in this context. But he did. He did. So that was how I uh, thought of it, that I got addicted to these uh, books. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm interested also, Ed, in sort of hearing uh, your kind of introductory comments, too, but I also have a question and, uh, for both of you. So last fall I taught, uh, just preceding teaching your book with that, uh, or your book of short stories with that ending story of, of the letter to, to Roth, taught Portnoy to a group of undergrads. And I, it was the second time I've done it. And in both instances, the, the students did not connect with the work in the way that I thought they would. You know, <laughs> they, they were put off by it, but not sort of excited by the, they, they didn't take the provocation. And I don't know if it just, the book doesn't speak to, to our time in a way. Um, and you know, because there's nothing romantic about it, you know. So he, you know, he was writing about his time and the experience that was so close to him. My students were very interested in romantic <laughs> stories about Jews in America. You know, they wanted their the identity affirmed. They wanted their place in society affirmed. They didn't want to be challenged in that way. And so it was very hard. We had to really walk through uh, passages. It was very hard getting them to read passages out loud in class for obvious reasons. Um, but I'm wondering what your experiences have been in teaching raw to students as well. And you know, have you had this experience or perhaps more success in talking to students? That's a, that's a good question for you, I think. I, don't, I mean, it's, it's, it is a good question. I, I don't know if I, I haven't taught Roth often, and in part because of the kind of courses I've been teaching, and in part because it's dangerous to teach the things you love. Uh, and uh, so I, I can't answer that question uh, directly that way. But I, I love the idea of thinking about how students respond to Portnoy and why they might not find it as transgressive or might not feel the need to read it in the closet. Uh, the way that, that perhaps others did. Uh, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that either, though. It, it, it strikes me as a question about, re related to what we were talking about earlier, how, we, how Elisa found in Philip Ross someone who could inspire her to, to live. Right? It's sort of an old-fashioned thing about literature, this idea we might read it and, and use it to learn how to be a human being in the world, and Philip Roth giving us lessons on that. Uh, but some of, the, some of the things that needed to be learned at certain times don't necessarily need to be learned right now, uh, or already so they're, are passé, or, or I, don't, I don't know. I was thinking when you were talking about, the, about Goodbye Columbus and, and the, the novella that gives that book its title, and the whole climax of the book, right? Right now, I don't know, how would that read to us right now when we get to the point where it's about uh, the diaphragm and. And, and, and the way that the, the birth control plays out in that story. And I don't know that it would resonate the same way that it resonated for readers then. I mean, the book is, the sentences still resonate, the, the characters still resonate, but those, those, those transgressions have lost some of their 
edge, perhaps. I mean, we'll get to the humbling, and the, the transgressions still have some life. Uh, but uh, maybe in, in the earlier work, those transgressions don't have the same kind of pull. Yes. Portnoy seems quaint. Yes. It's not titillating anymore. That's right. I mean, because somebody raised on the internet, not the internet. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like, what's the big deal? Yeah. You know? um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think a 16-year-old boy would read it the same way now, but, but maybe at, at 40, that same boy can sort of put it in historical context and imagine, you know, which also makes it hard to teach. You can't, you can't like, try to explain the experience of reading Portnoy uh, to your students. Or maybe you can. I don't, I don't know. See, before the internet, <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. Do you think the book of uh, The Nemesis uh, would be something that would appeal to a Jewish studies student? Because that's steeped in Jewish uh, practice. Uh, I think any rock book. Should be yes, to anyone interested in Jewish studies yes. or Jews or America or literature. I mean, yeah, I think it would be hard to argue otherwise. I think we, we haven't yet addressed this, but it, the, as, these, as books like Every Man, The Humbly and Indignation, Exit Ghost, and Nemesis come up, it's interesting to think of them grouped together in terms of what Roth is doing at the end of his life. Uh, well, and let's not deem him quite yet. No, I'm, I mean, the, <laughs> at the, okay, very nice, that's true. Thank you, Mary. At, at this stage of his career, uh, that, that's, that's, that's much better. That's, that, I certainly hope so. And he keeps killing his characters. I mean, Zuckerman, is Zuckerman gone for good? I, I hope not. Well, that's, yeah, I think so. I don't think he's going to go back on that. <laughs> Um, I think you said that uh, he hasn't written any nonfiction. Maybe I have not confused, but I think he's the one that wrote a book about his father. Yes, and he's taking, going home and taking care of his father. Yes. Yeah, no, he's written a lot of nonfiction. I mean, he's written a lot of essays, and he's written yeah. Patrimony. Patrimony is a pretty straight up, beautiful yeah. rendering of yeah. his father's and he's death. Got, like reading myself and others. And, and then he plays with the, the facts is kind of a you know, do we take that as being, I mean, almost, when, when Roth calls something a fact, what does that mean? He, he splits them up. We have Zuckerman books, like The Ghost Rider, Counter Life American Pastoral, The Insane, et cetera. And then he has Roth books, like The Facts, Operation Shylock, which is amazing, The Finest America, where he, he's using Philip Roth, but, but it's not straight nonfiction. We're not, we're not expected to think that this is, you know, the facts. I think was. But he, he's called it. He's called it so far into question that even when it seems straight, I think it's hard to say. I think. But, I mean, what, what's come into being in the last, I don't know, five, ten years um, in MFA programs and the like is something called narrative nonfiction, which I, it, that term didn't really exist um, until recently. Which is where you sort of take some of the tools of fiction and you take some of what you might have to use in your life or one's life or somebody else's life and you and you make some sort of a kind of Frankenstein hybrid um, where it's true but you're not supposed to take every I mean it, it's it, there's poetic license you're you know it's not reportage but I mean I think you're right that if there were if there were a spectrum right of, of fiction to nonfiction patrimony would be the example of Roth as close to nonfiction as he's going to get, except for maybe the essays about other writers and, and things like that. But he, do, he does group it right alongside works like Operation Shylock, The Plot Against America, which we know are, you know, the, 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 what happened in The Plot Against America is not true, uh, and uh, things like that. If you look at this sheet with some rock quotes on, on it, um, uh, the second one, the second and third uh, on the page of yes. the interview, and the first one, making fake biography, false history, concocting a half imaginary existence out of the actual drama of my life is my life. You don't necessarily, as a writer, have to abandon your biography completely to engage in an act of impersonation. It may be more intriguing when you don't. You distort it, caricature it, parody it, you torture it and subvert it, you exploit it, all to give the biography that dimension that will excite your verbal life. Um, so it, it just can't ever be as simple for Roth as, as 
true, not true, autobiographical, you know, fiction, non-fiction. It's just very, he, he subverts all of that. Yeah. Um, I read Poitner's complaint when I was in college, I believe, and uh, then I read a couple, I liked it a lot. I mean, I was kind of shocking, but I liked it a lot. And uh, then I read a, a couple more, and I did like them a lot, but I read later, Goodbye Columbus, and I would I couldn't believe it was the same author. Yeah. You know, it was like this is Philip Roth. You know, yeah. because I don't think it was misogynist particularly, and it did, dealt with a lot of problems that women have. You know, and I just it didn't seem like it's after that he, he had a different voice. I, I think, mm -hmm. which I liked a lot because some of it was very funny. We know Goodbye Columbus came first. That's what I mean, yeah. And then, I know that, but I'm saying, is anybody else had the same reaction? That it was a totally yeah. different kind of book? Yeah, it is. I think, I think you can, when you, when you look back at the early work with Roth, if you, if you read Goodbye Columbus, Let Him Go, and then something like When She Was Good, he, he, was, he was still figuring out what kind of writer he was going to be. Uh, and especially a book like Let Him Go or, or When She Was Good, he was trying to be a different kind of novelist. And then when he wrote Portnoy's Complaint, he, he in a way found the voice that was going to propel him for the rest of, at least up until this point in his still long, long career that's going to continue for many years. But, uh, but I, Portnoy's Complaint was a turning point. I think he would say that. I think, I think you experienced that uh, as a reader. It's almost like he exploded everything that he had done up to that point. Yes. And, he, and he, that's when he began to become this writer who was going to layer and layer and layer and sort of exploit himself and, and use what he had done up to that point and poke fun of himself and, and get a little meta and, and just start to circle around himself um, and never really give you a straight answer again, which is what makes him so compelling, I think, in the, in the, in the you know, later books, uh, the mid and later books. The earlier books, it's almost like I read them as almost like a, a, a good boy trying to please us and doing a great job. They're wonderful books. They're beautifully written. They're, I mean, if anyone else had written them and that was the entire body of work, you would still think that it was an impressive body of work. But, but Portner's complaint is when he suddenly, you know, it seems to me, I just have this kind of mental image of him saying, <laughs> you know, I mean, not to, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, I think he would appreciate that. It's yep. just kind of like, all right, I'm done. I've given you some very, like, good, books. They're, they're, they're not going to offend you, hopefully. And now I'm going to just mess with you for the rest of the month. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, I, I find him, for me, inconsistent. There are books of his that I absolutely love that I, and other books that I, I start with, no, no, I can't deal with this. Uh, and it has yeah. nothing to do with the, the sexuality. It just, it's too heavy for me. Uh, but when you say the greatest women is Jewish. I think of Dr. O, and I do think of a few others that, that may or may not still be with us, like Gallows and Wolf. There's a whole host. I mean, to single them off out, he's great. But I wouldn't single them out. I wouldn't forget the other two. Well, it's totally subjective. You know, I, there, there, there can't be an agreed upon best writer of all time. It's just. What, what are we calling? For, for me, <laughs> Greatest, what does it say? Just because it's in a family. Yeah. Greatest living American Jewish person. For me, he's, for me, it's not, take out Jewish, take out American. He's the greatest living writer for me. Um, Jewish has nothing to do with it. American has nothing to do with it, although I'm not as well read in other, in other uh, languages. Um, but, but, you know, that, that's not to say that has to be. But every year, Las Vegas picks him to win the Nobel Prize. He's, he's always the odds-on favorite. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen. Why? Why is it difficult? Why is it difficult? Why is it difficult? I have the same question. I, I think he's, 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 not, he's not a good boy. He's, he's not a people pleaser. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's not being a public intellectual. He's not, uh, he's not choosing the right way um, and I think he's, I think he's just had too much fun in his little room concocting his crazy stories, and he hasn't bowed to anybody or anything. And I don't think that's going to be rewarded in his lifetime that way. He's won everything else, but I think he'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Um,
Yes. I just have a question about writing in general, writing fiction. Uh, you know, like one of my favorite quotes is from John Irving, that he writes about his himself, his family, his life, and when he starts to lie, that's when he knows he has to write a novel. And isn't that really where most good fiction comes from, sort of taking your own experiences in life and then transposing it into from first person to third person? I think, I think the, the second quote from that interview speaks to that really, really nicely. Um, writing for me isn't a natural thing that I just keep doing the way fish swim and birds fly. It's something that's done under a certain kind of provocation, a particular urgency. The transformation through an elaborate impersonation of a personal emergency into a public act. Um, for me, that that uh, is absolutely true. It's, it's it, it, if you come upon something that you feel like you're going to die if you don't communicate, then you know that's a novel. I know that's a novel, um, and it's not. It's not. It's not a biographical thing. It's not. Like no, I need to no, tell you my story. No, it's like that. This thing is so big. I can't live with it. So I need to spend three, five, seven years transforming it into a narrative that makes sense of it for myself. Yeah. Maybe. It's still some aspect of yourself. Though. Yes. Sure. sure. Yes. It's like I mean, you know, like you, you see an actor on screen over and over and over again. You know that you know you don't, you don't know Robert De Niro just because you've seen thirty of his movies, but maybe in the repetition of of seeing him on that screen over the years, you, you come to see bits and pieces that you think maybe form, you know, what's really him. But he's, he's acting. It's, you know, I think that's the metaphor that, that best. Yeah, and this, could, um, this time I can give a teaching anecdote that goes back to maybe Barry's question in a way. That when, if you're teaching a fiction writing workshop, uh, sometimes what will happen is you'll, you'll talk about a story and it will be criticized. Like everybody around the room will go around and say, well, I didn't, this part didn't, didn't feel right to me. It, it made the story seem less powerful. And at the very end of that, the writer, the sort of learning to be writer, will, will pipe up and say, but how can you criticize that? That's exactly what happened. Uh, as if by, rent, by just copying down the truth, that makes it a good story. Uh, when in fact, it, it more often is the opposite, that you, you, you have to have some kind of invention that is, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yep, back there. Uh, a few years ago when Bella was still alive, and go back a little further, Malibu, the three maybe major Jewish writers mm -hmm. who wrote in English were Bellow, Malibu, and Roth. When Bella was alive, would you say Roth was the great, but it's just a matter of taste, would you say, well, here you have the big three. Now, there was another guy who didn't write in English, was Isaac Singer, and Joseph Epstein wrote an essay. He said, for posterity, the only one who will really last into the future is Isaac Singer. I don't know if that's true. But when Bella was alive, this is just a matter of taste, would you say he was on a par with Roth, or Roth was still the great? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're different. Um, Rock feeds me personally more. Um, he just, you know, he, he feeds me. Um, that, I have no problems with Bella. I think Bella's totally great, respectful, outstanding, awesome writer, but he doesn't feed me the same way. That's just me. What about you? What about me? <laughs> uh, I was hoping you wouldn't notice that I hadn't. Uh, uh, you know, I don't, it's an impossible question, right? I mean, they're, they're just, they're so incredible. And uh, I mean, the, the, the things about Roth that, that I admire, that amaze me, are the, the, the output on one level. I mean, just the, the, she, the, the sheer commitment to writing, at the, at, probably at the cost of so many other elements of his life. Uh, and the fact that he, you know, he does not have a child. Uh, and that, that's sort of the, the key to Elise's story in a way. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. And, and, and also, I, 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 what often gets overlooked with Roth, too, is that he's done so much for literature in general. Uh, he, he published a series of, of books from the other Europe where he was responsible for bringing, I think, to, to a large degree, someone like Milan Kundera or Bruno Schultz into the sort of canon for people in America to read. And, and that's, that, that seems to me another part of what, if the Nobel Prize Committee is listening to me right now, uh, that's another part of what they should consider uh, before awarding him the prize. So, but I, I can't answer your question. I, I, it's impossible. Not, not, not. 
to what extent has Roth paved the way, and what extent has he blocked the way for a younger generation of writers who are writing on similar themes, whether they think of themselves as Jewish American writers or are sort of cast as Jewish American writers? Like, so how has he helped it, and how has he hindered it? Can we can we tell the story of uh, of when when we saw him speak and and. Uh, I mean, Elisa, Elisa did write the story, which is an open letter to Philip Roth. And what people often ask her is, did he read the story? Uh, and, and did he write back or, or anything like that? And, and I, Elisa had sent the story to his, had gotten the address in Connecticut where Philip Roth resides and had sent the book. Uh, but there was, there was no, first there was no response. And then it, it was returned, right? <laughs> that says this address does not receive unsolicited mail. Right. <laughs> so, so one, I mean, we could have then been inspired to drive there and deliver it personally, but we, we, didn't, we didn't do that. Instead, he was speaking at Columbia, and, and we went to hear him speak. And I think this will get to your question in, somewhat, in a somewhat roundabout way. Uh, and, and we, uh, well, we were there. And, and at some point, Philip Roth asked if there were any questions. And, and uh, the braver of the two of us, Elisa, uh, raised her hand and, and said, said uh, well, are there, are there any things you, know, you shouldn't write about as a writer? And, and Philip Roth kind of looked over her and looked in her direction. And, and then instead of answering the question, just fired a question right back and said, well, what do you think? Uh, and, like what? Like what? Yeah, like what? Mm -hmm. And most, again, if you weren't a totally brave person like Elisa, you would have been cowed by that question and just, like, I, w I was sort of wondering what was going to happen, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and hoping it was going to work out okay. But Elisa just, right, without even missing a beat, said, I don't know, maybe Jews? And, uh, <laughs> and then I, I... He said, he said, he laughed, and he said, he said, oh, no, 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 you should definitely write about Jews. They're very hospitable people. They love it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I mean, so that's a way of saying what? Did he pave? Is that paving the way? Is that blocking the way? I think maybe what you're getting at is everybody, everybody in our generation who writes anything remotely comical or critical about that particular cultural yeah. milieu is compared to Philip Roth. Yes. Um, I think that's for the better. We should all be compared to Philip Roth because nobody's going to be able to express any dissatisfaction with Jewish sleepaway camp without being. But most of us need to be writing in response to what's come before us. So Roth is a cornerstone. I mean, Roth is, is, is there. I think that's part of why I, you know, included that story in, at the end of the collection. It's sort of like, okay, here, like, I'm addressing this already. This is how I want to be read. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is where I'm coming from. This is who formed me. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, there are, whatever. Uh, another story. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you what you know about the critical reception of his work early on. It seems I remember uh, a magazine nobody ever reads anymore called Common <laughs> Norman Hart <laughs> Lawrence. <laughs> Actually, Ed had a story in Common Carry. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 oh. Which nobody has read. <laughs> it seemed that. Uh, it was quite a put down. And people, the reviewer was actually offended by, uh, this was many decades ago, by Philip Roth's book. So I don't know if it's the part, of the part of the literary establishment, Jewish literary establishment, were very critical of him when his works, works came out. Very offended. Do you, do you have any sense of the, the critical reception? I'm sure it's changed now. The, the Jewish establishment was horrendously critical of him. I mean, traitor, self-hater. I mean, he, he was he was called every name in the book. I think for but a long time. Not no. I would go back to Columbus. Very angry. Yes. Um, yes. And then from then on, he was you know. The riot at JTS when he tried to give a talk there, and really? you know, there was the whole crowd came out right. in opposition. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, and, and you're right, it's evolved completely, it's come around, and, and now it's a very difficult argument to make uh, if you want to say that Philip Roth is XYZ. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's in part because I think it's so stale, in part because he's trounced all those things. And when you look at the trajectory of the books, also, I mean, if you were reading the books from beginning to end, you see him address that stuff. Um, I think part of what happened when he sort of burned the house down with Fortnite's complaint is when he said, okay, you know what? You're right. And like, F you guys. Like, yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm done trying to make you happy. Um, so, wait, so you had a question in the yeah. I hope at least of that Philip Roth writes you a letter. But not, not the real Philip Roth, like he writes a letter to your Elisa. <laughs> I, I, one of the things that we said we would do is compare the old Philip Roth to the new Philip Roth book. For me, the older ones were outrageous and they were funny. He's a funny guy. But the later ones, I think, are much more serious. Yes. To me, it started with, I think, American Pastoral, which I never forgot. That's an absolutely fantastic book. And, he does, and there, he doesn't have a truth. Zuckerberg tells a story about his friend, who's, I think, a, a, I don't know, an athlete, just a very great guy, white color, blonde. And uh, this terrible thing happens to him because his daughter uh, goes off becoming a, a radical or a, I don't know, whatever you call it. Well, I, don't know. I just thought after that, his, his books were no longer funny. You know, I think they got all three series. I think it lines up, it lines up with this sort of life cycle, I think. I mean, you reach a point they could, you know, reach an age. That's how I view it. Maybe I'll view it differently. I don't know, maybe you'll view it. I don't know, that's the way it seems. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think, I think it has to do with, you know, the, the, the earlier books were written when he was younger. Um, and you have a different, a different perspective on life when you're younger, and then it, it changes as a matter of course. And as much as we want to talk about Roth as someone who has these obsessions, who, who does Newark, who does, uh, who, has, who d explores his, these relationships with women, his, his relationship with his art is changing. And we were talking about this in the car driving over. It's like people must have gone up to Tolstoy near the end of his life and said, why won't you write another War and Peace? Why, <laughs> why, why won't you write another Anna Karenina? Why are you writing all these parables? You know, who wants to read parables? Uh, but that was what Tolstoy wanted to write. And I, I think when we look at these, these last books, not these most recent books uh, that Roth is writing, uh, they are, they're, they're in line with that. He's trying to figure something out. And it, it's, it's not about us. Uh, it's about him finding a way to keep writing and what's going to continue to inspire him, what is moving him right now. And he's clearly investigating mortality and, and, and uh, the loss of, of potency. He also talks about not having the, the, the energy or stamina at this point in his life to write one of those big books. Yes. I mean, not just big ideas, but literally big books. I mean, these are, these are all smaller books, and, and that's sort of his, his, his rhythm right now. Let's, let's talk about that. I think it's very fortunate that we have a writer who is able, who's able to be popular, sort of, when he was younger, and then we see him grow up, and we and he ages. Not a lot of authors do. They peter out. Uh, you know, they've got a few good books in them, and then we don't hear from them anymore, and we don't know what's going on. You know, they go off in other directions. Hopefully, you guys won't, because I love your books. Um, <laughs> but you know, you when when the critics went after him 30 years, uh, 40, 50 years ago, um, the critics were young, and that hopefully some of those. Die. <laughs> um, so you, 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 you know, you, the critics, the critics. What happens to them? They go away, and then a new generation and another generation finds these authors. And it depends on how the whole scheme of things have changed. And what um, Joel was saying about you. Know, oh, Joel. Saying? Joel, where are you? Joel? Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. But um, I get my names, very bad with names. But um, when, when the students, you have students, students are very conservative. They really are. They do, they'll go online and they'll see things, but they'll hide it from you if you go into their room. I have a 25-year-old and I have a 46-year-old uh, stepson. And she'll talk to him and he'll talk to her. But many times they won't talk to me, and I've tried to bring this up. And you can't talk about sex 
they'll read the book, but they don't want you, Ed, to bring it up. They don't want you to bring it up in class. They don't want you to bring it up in class. They want to read this stuff on their own, if they do, and they're not going to talk about it because it's embarrassing to them. But they'll read it, and they'll have their own thoughts about it. And maybe they'll write it on a paper because they'll know only you'll see it. But they don't, they don't want to deal with the rest of the class. And you know, to kind of force it on them, you're not going to force it out of them. They are very, um, they're very, very conservative in their private lives, and it's embarrassing. And um, they get it. I didn't want to talk about this book when I was their age, and I and I was reading Roth for a long time. My father told me he said you should read this. My father, my father was a big reader, and he says you should read this. You're going to like this. And he never asked me because he knew. He never asked me how I liked that book. But that book is, has stayed with me. It's yellow. It's, port, it's Portnoy's Complaint. Oh, yes. yeah, it's yellow. yellow. The pages are falling yeah. out. And I'll never get rid of it. <laughs> because because yeah. I, I learned something very sure. interesting, A, about the opposite sex, mm -hmm. about my own you know, about my own mentation, where I, where I was, and, and also something about embarrassment, and yet, um, and, and yet I, could, I could relate to it, even though I was a woman. And I, I, it's... Yes. I met a big breakthrough here. I discovered my whole life I've been confusing the narrator with the author. And I have to tell you, the worst case I ever had was Unless I read How This Night Is Different before I ever knew you, you were terrified. <laughs> I thought, I'd be scared to meet this woman. <laughs> and I've been in the audience three times, and you're so lovely. <laughs> Actually, I get that a lot. You do? Oh, okay. I thought people, people say, like, nice to meet you. And <laughs> you say, all right. So it's just same old, same old. But then, ordinary man, I thought you must be the nicest guy. And and I, actually, I'm terrible. <laughs> Fierce. Fierce, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I like to compare Philip Roth with Woody Allen. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of parallels. I'm not, I'm not talking about content, even. Just the, the, the trajectory of the careers and the way the, the perceived ownership of the artist by the artist's public um, and the way that, that, you know, we like to think we know Woody Allen. We like to think, you know, we have a real handle on his issues and who he is and what he's up to and why he does the things he does and we get outraged by him and we, we, we sort of think, we, we think we know him. Um, and that's his particular gift. He kind of gets us to think that and that's kind of what Ralph does too. And uh, my, my uncle tells a story about standing in line at Double Day Bookstores in Manhattan in 1978 behind Woody and, and saying, Hey, so to tell you, you're so great, I love Annie Hall, you're awesome, you're really young. And he just completely expressionless turned uh, 90 degrees <coughs> so he's not facing my uncle anymore. <laughs> and then the people on the other side of him say, hey, you're Woody Allen, I just have to tell you, you're so great, Annie Hall is the best, I love you. He turned another 90 degrees and he wasn't there. He just, he just had no response whatsoever and was trying to Woody Allen is a jerk. He really is. Maybe. Maybe. He's 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 <laughs> Perhaps. I don't know. He goes but to France and there's a lot of anti Semitism. And he said that there that he didn't he personally didn't explain it. As if that's the answer to that kind of thing. Well, regardless. Mm -hmm. He uh, I think there's something in that in that about the sort of alienation of you know, when when you put something out there in the world and people respond to it. They, they, they then can feel like they own you in a way, or they know you, or they have access to you, or they have some sort of, um, and I think, you know, anybody who ever does anything experiences that. You know, I've published two books, and I've experienced that on like a small scale, um, and so I can't even imagine what it must be like for somebody of Roth's stature, where you can't go anywhere, you can't talk to anybody, Every, you know, he can't say anything that you want to fill, um, and, and not, you know, not in a shallow way. People think they have a deep, deep understanding of who this human being is. Um, and that's kind of a tragedy. I mean, imagine him, you know, alone in his house in Connecticut with no unsolicited mail. And, you know, if he never has it, he doesn't have the internet, he doesn't have email, he just does not want contact. To what extent do you think that both of them invited, uh, given the personas that they create, 
naming characters after themselves in the case of Rock, and, and, and Alan putting himself <laughs> as the star of his characters. And then with both of them using the you know, using psychoanalysis and kind of you know, it's all about getting to the true self and putting their own character, their own persona under that in a microscope. To what extent do you think they invite this? I think they, 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 they can be said to invite it, but I think they have no choice. I don't think it's a, I could live a nice, quiet life and be totally fulfilled and happy and satisfied, or I could, you know, engage in a complete mindfuck for the next 50 years and effectively destroy the chance I have to have, like, a, a, a normal relationship with anybody in the world. I don't think anybody chooses that, you know, make that choice really. I think you have no choice. You, you have this, you know, what does he call it? This, this, this urgency, this, this, you know, I, if I do not communicate these things, if I don't find a way to put some of what I grapple with out in the world, I will be sunk by it. I can't live. I mean, another, another way to think about it too, I mean, it goes along with this, I think. We were talking about another conversation in the car was uh, the way in which, for me, this goes back to Melville. Like, Melville would complain when he was sending his books out into the world that, uh, that he wanted to be in correspondence with the world. He, he just wanted that desperately, but people weren't reading his, his letters or what he was putting out there. And uh, I think that explains Woody Allen and, and Philip Roth to a certain extent, a desire to be in correspondence with the world, but not necessarily pleased with uh, what is returned to them. And, uh, but they can't stop trying. Uh, and, and maybe that goes back to that earlier comment about uh, what Kathy was saying about how he's just misanthropic as opposed to mis mis uh, a misogynist. He, he is constantly disappointed uh, by what the world gives back to him. Uh, but the comparison of uh, Woody Allen and uh, Philip Roth, both of them had a wife that both wrote a book about him. <laughs> Claire Bloom's book, you would think he was a fiend, he didn't like a daughter, he pushed her out. Woody Allen's wife, and she a putative incest. Now, I love them both as writers, and also they both had that with their wives. And uh, he found, Woody Allen's wife found pictures of him nude with, quote, their daughter. Now, as far as I'm concerned, they're both great writers, but does that affect your reading when you think they're both maybe at least not very, very nice guys to their wives? <laughs> Uh, well, there are I a lot of people who are not very nice to their wives who don't write anything good. <laughs> <laughs> but not just not nice, I mean really bad guys. In both of those, uh, not, uh, quote, non-fiction books, at least from their perspective. I don't, I don't know what really happened between yeah, them. No. Right. I, I you're, you're asking the impossible questions today. You, you, want, you want us to rank Bellow and Roth, and, and, and you want us to sort of adjudicate uh, the sort of divorce proceedings of, of these writers. I'm, I'm not interested in, in who they are personally, because I'm not involved with them personally. If either one of them was my relative or my partner or something, then I would have a different investment. I'm only interested in their work. Um, and I think that it's their assholes, like, that sucks for people around them, and I hope they get better, but it's not my problem. <laughs> there are two things, though, that you're bringing up about Roth and about his personal life. I happened to bump into him on a number of occasions in the summer at the Norfolk Chamber Concerts, which is not too far from where he lives in Connecticut. And I have observed him, you know, from a distance, and I sort of gone like this to him, but I have not tried to engage him in conversation because I think he is exactly that kind of a person who isn't looking to be lauded or patted on the back or anything of the kind. However, if you've ever seen the movie of the human stain, you see Zuckerman in a little house, a very nice little house in the woods, exactly how Roth lives, except Roth lives in a great big something, and this guy lives in a nice little log cabin. But the interplay between Coleman Silk in that book and how he finds this young man living in the woods, exactly like the, the way Roth does, tells me something about what you're talking about. He doesn't particularly wish to engage, so what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. But you're trying to get it from the literature. But that picture, that motion picture of a human stain, you can see, you know, it's not exactly the way Roth lives, but it certainly is akin to the way he lives. Mm -hmm. And when I see him at concerts, he's pleasant, he's often alone, he's almost always alone. 
Um, but he's there for the same reason I am, to hear the music, not to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob, so I'll go back to the thing about public intellectual. People have mentioned about American Pastoral, and now about Hugh Hussein, what was the other one, American Communist, um, which could have been perfect opportunities to be public intellectual because there's so much of that American life and history, you know, in the middle of the 20th century and so on. So I'm, I don't know what I'm asking. Because I mean, <laughs> most everybody's saying, guys, I've never, never talked to anybody anyway. But, but it seemed like there was so much stuff that people tend not to talk about that is so core to what made this particular country and its culture what it is, that it seemed like the perfect stuff to have those conversations. So you're asking why? Why isn't he a public intellectual? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the myths are up. Then I guess you know one shouldn't ask that. But 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 I would, it surprised me when those came out um, that there were generally, if I remember the reviews correctly, it was like, oh, these are the reviews were about other oh, oh, novels, and that seemed to me to be not a very interesting conversation compared to the conversations that would have been more interesting, which is about what they raised. Yes. You know, no, it's, it's, I think it's a good question in light of the way that people tend to knock Philip Roth. I mean, you, you, one, I have no access to the deliberations of the Nobel Prize Committee. Uh, and yet one thing that people say about why he hasn't won is because he's a, like a navel gazer or he's, he's, so, he's, he's just exploring his own neuroses. Uh, and that's sort of a knock against Philip Roth. But I, don't, I think you're, you're pointing out exactly why that's just not accurate. Uh, he's explored so much about American history, about the world, about the, the history of, of the American Jew, about uh, what it means to move from Europe to America. I mean, it, his, he's, he's a global writer in, in many ways. He's, he's the opposite. I mean, he, yes, he writes about neuroses. He writes, he, he, is a, he explores uh, Newark, but he explores Newark the same way Faulkner explored Yoknapatafa County uh, or, or, or Joyce explored Dublin. Uh, that doesn't make them local writers, uh, it makes them global citizens. So I, I, again, I think you're just, you're just giving more uh, justification for uh, Roth winning the Nobel Prize someday. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, one, one, I mean, where are we in? I just want to have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. And just a reminder to please fill out your cards. Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll say, I worked for Sandy Roth, his brother, for Batman. Well, close to four years. We were in advertising. And um, there would be daily phone calls between him and his brother. And it was very volatile and very loving. A lot of it had to do with his father and how ill his father was. And after all of that, after three or four years, eventually he wrote Patrimony. And um, Sandy Roth was the antithesis of his brother. A lovely, 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 um, and and very rational, and he, he was sort of like the the relationship between Van Gogh and Theo. <laughs> that, that's how I used to think of it, and um, you know the where Theo is the rational individual, but the, and they'd have this conflict, and out of that came patrimony because his father was ill, and his father had asked him after the father read the manuscript. He says, please don't publish this. Don't write anything about our relationship. And then you wonder, well, you can't ask that of a writer. How do you do that? Well, maybe you disguise it a little. But what I read after Patrimony, I mean, I, that had me crying because I think it was one of the best memoirs of a father, son, and a child taking care of his parent or her parent. And to get this, to ask a writer, don't use the material. I mean, it sort of got, you know, and I always wondered, did he really mean that? Did the father really mean that? Because it wasn't, you know, did the father understand his own child? Um, so, what do you think of that? Of the, of the patrimony and... About, about asking a writer not to use something? Because one thing you said, writers are always joking, and writers are always selling somebody out. <laughs> I mean, you can't do it. You can't. You can't tell a writer not to. Hey, you can tell a writer not to do something, but what do you think? Hopefully, hopefully the writing. 
I like to imagine that the writing itself would justify whatever is being quote unquote used if it's if it's thoughtful and and meaningful and it's being used well and then 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 it's not a, a you know any sort of violation. Um, hopefully, I think if it feels like a violation. It's probably not being done right. But then again, you know, there you can't please everybody. I, 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 I've had the experience, um, well, you're a nicer person, but I've had the experience of, <laughs> of, of somebody reading something that has nothing to do with them and, and taking it personally and thinking that it's about them or that it's based on them when, in fact, I have never even come close to that. So people, again, I think we come back around to the reader of the book is, is, is the main event. The reader of the book is bringing to the book 9% of you know what the book is going to be for that person. Um, whatever's there is, is just kind of a broad outline that the reader then fill in however he or she is you know, disposed to do. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs>a terrific conversation. I would also like to thank Bonnie Edelstein from the Center for Jewish Studies who organized this event and without whom none of this would be possible. Also many thanks to Joe Nash, the, the, the library for setting everything up and thanks to all of you for coming and for making this one of the, the, the best conversations I've, I've heard about, about text before and an author so thank you. And,